I guess if you clap before you start, then you know you might not ever hear that again. So um, I appreciate everybody showing up. I didn't realize it's going to be this many, uh, but we're we're happy to have everybody here. I will tell you that this is the first time I've done this kind of presentation. I, I tend to focus more on international stuff, but we decided we were going to do a full safety brief or talk, which discusses um, just your daily life, ways to be safe. So I've combined a lot of information to a relatively short period of time. We could sit here for probably the rest of the evening talking about safety issues. So there's no way you're going to touch on everything, but hopefully we're going to hit some key points. And what I hope you go away with is you pick up a couple ideas of something you hadn't thought about before that will help you be safer in what you do every day, uh, whether it's here, whether it's traveling internationally or walking to your house from a grocery store or whatever. Um, hopefully then, then it's worth it because anytime you can do something to make yourself a little bit safer in a world that's becoming more dangerous, the better. Um, I'm Doug Wilson. A guy named Murphy is here today too. I don't know if he will make himself known or not, but it's, you've heard of Murphy's Law and anytime you deal with technology, that kind of stuff happens. So hopefully this will all go smooth. Uh, I came from a, let me see if we get this work. See, he's already showed up. There we go. Um, this talks a little bit about me. I do have a little bit of a background in some things that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I spent a long time with the uh, military. I was in the Air Force and I got into the reserve component and got involved a lot after 9-11 with a bunch of uh, terrorism type stuff going on. Traveled the world a lot doing that. Um, so I have done this kind of talks to uh, military personnel before they deploy overseas or in deployed locations on how you can be in other countries and stay safe. Uh, it doesn't matter where you go in the world these days, um, it's not near as safe as it may have been at one time. And so there are things you need to be aware of anytime you travel anywhere. So my background dealt with a lot of that. I uh, worked with, um, got involved in some uh, counter intel and counter terrorism type things in other countries. Um, I have worked with a lot of individuals before they travel. They've asked me and I've consulted with them on what's going on in the countries they're going to, as well as groups that do group travel to other countries on where they're going and what they need to be aware of. Um, and you know, ways to blend in a little bit better in the countries that you go to so that you don't stick out so much as an American. It's good to be proud to be an American in this country, but when you go to other countries, don't advertise it too much. That's anywhere in the world now. Um, the agenda today, I think you probably have that in front of you, is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about daily life type issues, you know, just how you can be safe in your homes and the things that you do on a day-by-day -day sa uh, basis. Home safety and home invasions, you hear more and more in the news now about home invasions, it's scary because they don't care if you're home or not, they'll come in. Uh, safety for seniors, we do touch on that a little bit. Again, any of these topics could be a full session. We could, we could spend two or three hours on just one topic. So we're covering a lot of information and maybe we could come back another time and really focus on specific areas that might be interest in. Uh, safety when uh, walking and driving. Um, Everybody does both of those, and so what are some issues you need to be aware of? What are some concerns that you've had uh, that have happened to you? We'll talk about some of those. And then international travel, we'll get into that pretty specifically. Along with international travel, it's not on your slide page there. Can everybody hear me, by the way? I tend to talk pretty loud according to what some people say. But um, international travel will include some air, airline tips. I think everybody, whether it's domestic or international, those of you that do a lot of flying nowadays, there's nothing at all luxurious about it, but we'll talk about some things on just flying safety. Um, and some self-defense tips. We want to get into some self-defense basic things. I do have some videos if they're working properly. We're not going to get into a lot of stuff in here. Um, I, do have, I do want everybody to understand some of the things that you can have personally that can help you in self-defense. Um, I have a taser. We're going to have everybody come up. We're going to tase you so you get the idea what that feels like. Um, <laughs> Oh, they're laughing. Um, you, know, you need to know how it would feel to the guy that's someone that's coming after you so you can understand how it works. So everybody will form a line and we'll... Um, uh, but we're going to go through a few different items today that may... Just simple things that if you will just remember them, most of the time when somebody or a perpetrator comes after you, they don't expect that you know any of this stuff. Um, if there is just a few things you can do to throw them off where they think, wow, this person... Knows, knows what they're doing, then you're, you, that's 50% of it right there. Most of the time they're going to catch people by surprise. They don't expect they're going to know any way to get out of what situation they put you in. But we'll talk about a few of those and there's some really good videos that I hope we'll pull up when we need them. Uh, this shows a little bit uh, of my travels and I, I've left a couple things off that I just noticed. But some of these are some of the countries I've been to and um, 
some of you might be familiar with that bottom left picture there. That's from a place called Torquay, England, if anybody remembers that. So uh, it doesn't look like it. looks like it could be Italy or something. But, um, so I've traveled around the world a little bit, and I've been exposed to a lot of different cultures and a lot of different things that can go wrong. But uh, traveling the world's a great thing to do. It's a lot of fun. Um, and here's the, here's the thing I want you to go away. Knowledge is your best self-defense. The best thing that you can learn from all of this is that uh, if I know how to prevent myself from being in bad situations, that's, that's a major part of it. Because most of the time when things happen to you, it's something you didn't notice, were not aware of, or weren't keen enough to prevent because of something you might not have done. So if you can just be aware, better aware of your surroundings, be more alert, uh, those kind of things are going to help you down the road to keep you from being in a situation where you have to enact in some kind of physical way to somebody that might be trying to attack you. Um, so let's get started with this. Safety at home. Am I moving around too much for what you're doing? Okay. Safety at home. We're going to start talking about this first of all because there's just some basic things we all need to know about our homes. This is really generic, simple stuff. Um, it's all stuff you've heard before, but maybe you'll hear something that will reinforce an idea that, yeah, I really ought to do this. So there's nothing really rocket science about any of this, and I think everybody's heard some of this stuff before. But here's 10 security tips. Uh, at home, carbon monoxide, and this isn't all just safety again. This is safety where you're living in a safe home. Um, does everybody have smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors? Or one of the, do you all have those in your house? If you don't, you really should. If you don't, that's a good tip for you right there. Get them. They're not expensive. You need to have either a monitored fire smoke system or you can buy these battery operated things that work just fine, but you need to have that in your home. Um, and they all have sensors in them that can detect that stuff. Sometimes the sensors are a little too good. Uh, whether you're buying, building, or remodeling your home, uh, you know, and I think that's pretty much a requirement through code nowadays is that uh, roofing has to be fireproof, so always check on that. Um, some of this stuff I don't do. I don't know that I would do, but uh, some of the suggestions are that you have a locked mailbox at your home where people can open it up. They can find out a lot of information, a lot of identity theft now um, by opening up your mailbox and going through your stuff. They, they can learn a lot about you if you're concerned about that happening in your neighborhood. Um, so that's something to think about. Anytime you're going to be away from home for a long period of time, uh, a lot, most of us use cell phones now. There are still people that have landlines that go into their house, you know, for security systems and all that. They still have a home phone. Uh, turn your ringer way down so that somebody that might know your number doesn't stand outside and call your number and you hear it ring, 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 ring while they're obviously not at home. So if you can set your ringer down to a low level, they wouldn't be able to hear that anyway. Uh, like I say, I, don't, I think this probably applies to maybe 50 or 60 percent of the people now because a lot of people just don't have landlines in their house. Um, but it is something to think about. Something else I like to do that I don't think this talks about is um, leave a radio on when you're gone. It uses very little power. Get a little radio set and turn it on to some music station so that anybody that might be even breaking in your house hears music upstairs. And that's you're going to use very, very little power. It's not going to cost you any money. But it's nice to have that background noise going when you're not at home. Uh, never leave notes on your door for service people. Uh, I don't know, that, that's not something I don't think many people do, but don't leave a note about how to get in the house and all that fun stuff, or where the, key, where the key's hidden. Don't ever put a key under the front doormat. Don't hide keys anywhere. Now, I, again, I break that rule because I got a place I can hide a key that I, if they find it, they deserve what I have. But um, there's only certain people that would know where that is. Uh, extension cords. Just living at home, extension cords can cause you a lot of problems if you use the wrong kind of cord in the wrong place. Indoor cords are meant for indoors. That's why they say that. Don't ever use an indoor cord outside. If you're ever doing any kind of work outside, uh, make sure you're using an exterior or an outside cord. This orange one is actually uh, any outside cord can be used inside, but that's an outside. They're usually big, thicker. They're usually orange or brightly colored. But don't ever use an indoor extension cord for an appliance outside. Um, Something about the, this is sort of random, but your freezer, everybody's had power outages, right? Do you ever wonder about, I wonder how long my stuff's going to stay good before it goes bad? Uh, typically, it's about 48 hours. You can keep stuff in your freezer and your refrigerator for 48 hours, and you should be able to still, you know, eat it without it going bad. Now, again, if you open and shut your refrigerator and freezer a lot, that's going to let that cold air out. So ideally, if you have a power outage or some sort of emergency, the hurricanes that come in and knock things out, uh, ice storms or whatever, 
you can generally keep your stuff safe for that amount of time if you're not using it. If you've got an ice storm, just stick it outside. It'll be fine. <laughs> We've done that before. Um, it's recommended to have interconnected smoke alarms. Now, by code, when, if you're building a house or if you've had any remodeling done over probably the last 10 years, there is a code that requires them to come in and put these battery-powered smoke detectors uh, in, in carbon monoxide, actually. They put them in all the rooms, all the sleeping rooms of the house, the bedrooms, and they're interconnected. So if it's detected in one room, it's going to go off. Whether you have a, 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 if you have a system that's wired in and alarmed, um, you're still going to have this if they're going to do any kind of renovation because by code you have to have that now. So uh, that's probably a good thing. They're just ugly. They're just all over the walls, you know. Um, Rechargeable batteries, this is pretty basic. Don't try to recharge a battery that's not rechargeable. I don't know if you've ever had the desire to do that. But um, oily rags, everybody has, lots of us have garages and places where our car is parked and we have paint and we have stuff that we do work with. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but any kind of um, rag that has residue from paint thinner or you might have used it you know, to wipe oil up from the garage or your lawnmower and it's got that residue on it, if you keep it bunched up, in a corner somewhere, it can spontaneously combust. I'm not a physics major, so I can't explain why that happens, but it can spontaneously catch fire. So don't ever keep rags that have those kind of uh, uh, materials on them wadded up anywhere in your house. Uh, make sure you wash those out or throw them out or do something, because that, that has happened more than once. Uh, here's a few, this is just a graphic of some things that we talked about. Uh, electric, de electric devices, you know, don't stick things in a toaster. This is sort of basic. I don't know why they put that on this slide. Only use an electronic. I don't know if anybody uses electric lawnmowers, but don't cut. Some of this stuff is, I guess somebody did this once, so they had to make a slide about it. But you don't use electric lawnmower in wet grass. That makes sense. Uh, insist on appliances certified by, uh, this is a Canadian thing, so we don't worry about that. Never remove a plug with wet hands when touching metal. I hope everybody knows that. Uh, use certified power bar if you need to plug multiple items into an outlet. Anytime you have these power strips, make sure you get, you spend a little more money on them. Don't get the cheap drugstore brands. Get one that's got um, all the built-in safety features for circuit protectors and all that because they can be a fire hazard if you plug too many things into them. Or if you have an extension cord that just has two or three outlets to it. You need to be careful about that. Whether it goes under a rug, you don't want to step on them over time. You can fray the wires inside of it. You don't ever want to walk on extension cords. Really basic stuff. I think a lot of you have heard this before, but it's worth taking a look around your house and making sure you, know, you're, you don't have these sort of issues. Um, some of the home safety things that are worth thinking about, just so that you can stay safe at your home. Um, again, a lot of this is basic stuff that you probably have. We'll start at the top left. Solid core doors on the outside. Most exterior doors, if you look at your house, they probably built it. It's probably just fine. Interior doors, it doesn't matter. But you want to make the exterior door as strong as possible so that it can't be pried open as easy. Garage door closed and locked. You know, I, I drive through neighborhoods sometimes, and people are working out in the yard, or maybe they're doing some work around the house. And I'll see garage doors open for hours. One, I don't do it because it lets all the hot air in or the cold air in, and it makes your utilities go up. So I don't ever do that for that reason. But it's, it's amazing the people that just leave their doors open a good bit of the day. Um, and they might be in the house doing stuff, but they just leave it open because they're coming and going. But that's real easy, particularly nowadays with uh, the, the, the home invasion incidences and things like that. It makes it so easy for people to just come in your house. And I would never recommend doing that. Just close your garage door. Uh, don't leave it open for any reason. If you're out in the yard and you're going back and forth and you're outside, you're seeing everybody coming, that's probably okay. But don't just leave it open and go up into the house and don't go run an errand at the store and leave the door open so you don't have to click the button when you come back. Um, quality deadbolt locks. Does everybody have deadbolts on their exterior doors? Does everybody have that? that is, if you don't, go to, the, go to Lowe's or something on the way home today and get a deadbolt get someone to install it for you. That is extremely important to have that. Um, also, if it's, a, if it's a main entrance door and it's got any kind of glass in it, you don't want the kind that has, um, where you don't want to leave your key, you don't want the kind that has a little latch on it that you can undo it, and you don't want to leave your key in that unless it's at night. You want to be able to get out if there's a fire. So you always want to have a way that you can get yourself out without looking for a key to undo it, but I would take that out during the day when you're gone. At night, I would leave the key in the deadbolt so that if you did have a fire and it's smoky and you got to run to the door, you know the key's there and you just have to turn it. You don't have to hunt around for a key and stick it in because that, that could be a real issue. 
Could be a little risk if you have a window. Someone could bust it in and get themselves in. But if you're at home, you're going to hear them bust through that little glass window. But I would, I would risk that rather than trying to find where the key is and smoke. And uh, you have very limited time to get out if something like that were to happen. Shrubs are a big issue to me. Um, if you've got a house that's got windows that are in the front or anywhere around the house, if I'm a bad guy, I'm going to go hide behind the shrub by the window until it looks safe, and then I'm going to figure out a way to pry in the window. I'm not going to keep my shrubs high enough where somebody can hide behind them. That's the way I look at it. Um, shrubs are nice, and you can have them, but don't have them so tall that people can hide behind them and break in your house. Uh, because if it's, I've seen sh a lot of people that have shrubs that go way over the windows of their house. You could break the glass. Nobody would see it because they don't see your window. So if you've got a way to get in, don't, don't let it be blocked by a shrub. Um, basement windows, if you have a basement, they all, by code, if you're using it as a room, whatever, there has to be uh, some sort of window well or it could be a basement window. Don't forget about those. There's ways you can get down inside those little wells and break in. That's an easy way to do it. So make sure you have a reinforced window or something on it or people can't break in very easily. Um, draw shades at night so people can't see all your stuff inside your house. I know we all probably leave our shades up some. But if it's, you're at home alone, you, know, you don't want to have shades up. And also, anybody can see what you have. If you're on vacation, stop your mail. Get a neighbor to pick it up. That's a common sense thing. I don't know if people think about that. But you don't want papers piling up in your yard. And you don't want your mailbox overflowing. And it, it gives a signal even to the mail person. I'm sure they're trustworthy. But when there's mail and three or four days of mail, they know you're not at home. So don't give people that idea. Most people have neighbors they can depend on for that. So a few tips there. Don't want to get too much into this. Um, Peepholes on doors, very important, so you can see. You, you, wanna, you don't want to open the door. You want to look in and see who that is that rang your doorbell at 2 in the afternoon or at 7 at night. Uh, something else I, it's good to do is keep uh, like a hammer, something close by one of the doors that people would come to. And uh, if, if you feel a little bit funny about something, just pick the hammer up like you've been working in the house a little bit and open the door, and you've got a hammer in your hand. <laughs> And uh, I, I was just doing some work. But if somebody's trying to do something, it doesn't take much of a whack with a hammer. If they were thinking about doing something, they see you with a hammer. If they're a friend of yours, I mean, they're going to say, why are you holding a hammer? And you just tell them, I didn't know who you were. But if you, um, if you come to the door with a hammer and it's a stranger, if they're thinking about doing something, they probably won't. Now, I mean, that would be the, the best thing to do. You wouldn't want to have a, any other kind of object, you know, some people have guns in their house, that's probably not the best way to greet people that come to your house, but a hammer would be okay. Um, don't advertise, leaving a note, yeah, we already talked about that. Um, I'm not real big about having our names on mailboxes, I don't see too many people that do that nowadays. Uh, so I, would, I wouldn't advertise who you are because you can look people up through Google or whatever and say, oh wow, they're, they're a physician, they probably make a lot of money, I'll go rob them. So if you just have a number on there, you're safer. Um, the average predator will watch you six to 12 times before they commit the crime. So again, that's an awareness thing. Be aware of who's watching you. If you see somebody that you saw two days ago in the same spot, be real suspicious. That's what law enforcement's for. But um, I don't know if that statistic's accurate, but it makes sense. Most people will do pre-surveillance uh, on anything that they're gonna, that they have uh, nefarious ideas about. So, um, all right, buy a dog dish. That's, that's a good idea. I didn't know about this until I started reading through some of this. If you don't have a dog, get a dog dish and put it by the door. Because criminal comes up, I'd get a big old dish too. It's like, <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, I think I'll go to the next house. And um, because they think you got some big dog. So, you know, that's, that's a good idea. I didn't think about that. Uh, I've got cats, but cat dish, cats are afraid of everything, so that's not going to bother them. Uh, replace, when you move to a new house or apartment, obviously, if you really know the people you bought the house from, I think you're okay. But a good safety thing would be to replace the locks. The apartment won't do it for you, do it yourself. It's not that big of an investment. But just to be safe, because keys can get copied and duplicated. Um, the best lock in the world is no good if it isn't used. Lock your doors. I know a lot of people that stay at home, and they keep their doors unlocked. They, they stay in their house with their doors unlocked. You know, is, this isn't Mayberry anymore. You've got to lock your doors. Uh, we talked about the shades. Burnout light bulbs. You know, I also like, I don't know if I have this in here or not, but timers. It's really nice to have lights coming on arbitrary times in your house at night, even when you're at home. Just have several lights on a timer, and they'll just pop on. You know, one will pop on at 6 in the afternoon, and another one 7 o'clock at night, and then they'll, go, they'll stay on a few hours, and they go off. But anybody watching your house when you're out of town, you're going to have these lights coming on at different times. 
that's easy. You go buy a few timers, don't, they don't cost anything. Program them to come on at six and go off at 11. Um, and whether you're home or not, just let them come on and go off and do their thing. And then anytime you're gone, you know lights are coming on and going off. I think that's a really good thing if you haven't done that or if you're not doing that. Anybody in here do that? Yeah, good. We talked about service workers. Again, we get, I have plenty of service workers come to my house, and I don't sit there and grill them about who is a person coming to my house, how long have they been with you, did you do a background check. It's probably a good idea if you're a little leery about that. Um, just know who's coming to your house. Deal with companies that have some reputation to them or that were referred by somebody. Most big companies are going to be pretty reputable. If it's somebody, you know, some individual that has their own company out there, I'd be a little leery about that unless they were recommended to you. Um, just know who's coming into your house to do things. Uh, and then neighbors, we talked about your neighbors. It's great to be in a neighborhood where you have a few retired folks or maybe some stay-at-home people uh, that are always watching after things. Get to know those people. Let them know what your schedule is so they know that I'm usually gone from 7 to 6 every day. My house is empty. I'm not expecting any visitors. So if you see a car pull up, it's not anybody I was expecting. Um, we talked about the timers. I won't go into any more of that. When you're gone, we talked about that. Have people look after your stuff. Uh, be selective about your personal information. You know, just tell the people that you trust where you're going and how long you're going to be gone. If you're going out of the country, social media. I don't think I got into that too much. That's a whole. We could spend five hours on that. Social media. I see people that will put, you know, oh, we're at the airport getting ready to go to Greece for two weeks. We're, you know, and then pictures while they're there the whole time. Um, it's. It, you do that when you come back and say, hey, I was in Greece, here's my pictures, not I'm in Greece. It just tells me, oh, nobody's at home, I'm going to go rob them. Uh, so you got to be real careful about sharing where you're going and what you're doing with people. Uh, taking, now, home invasions, this is something else. Taking steps to prevent your home from being approached, targeted by burglars is important. You need to think about what you can do to make yourself safer. Again, this is becoming more prevalent, unfortunately. Um, and there really is not a lot you can do if somebody busts in your house with a rifle or shotgun, uh, you're, you're a bit vulnerable. And if they really want to come in in a home invasion, they're not looking for the discreet way to come in. They're busting down the front door, coming through a window. Um, don't, again, the key thing, don't make it easy for them. The key's under the doormat or anywhere. Don't have them hanging on, you know, anywhere in potted plants. That's where they're going to go look. Uh, when having your, don't leave your entire key ring. Because anybody can take your keys. They say, here's a house key. I'm going to copy it. I know what their address is because they're doing business with me and I know who they are. Uh, and you never know who all has access to those kind of things. So take your automobile key off. Just give them that. Don't give them your two or three keys. Uh, we talked about peepholes earlier, but have those where you know exactly who's coming in if somebody's banging on your door. Uh, burglar alarm systems are very you know, it's worth having, honestly, uh, monitored or unmonitored. If you monitor, you can spend anywhere from 18 to probably 30 bucks, depending on what all, how sophisticated it is. You might go up to 50 bucks a month. But um, you have a, a, a company that's monitoring. If someone breaks in, they call you. They start calling your cell phone, your home phone, trying to get you. If they can't get you, they're going to send the police. If they do get you, you've got to have a code to tell them. Uh, and there's usually a duress code where you tell them a code, which means I got somebody holding a gun to me right now. But you give them a code and they know, oops, you know, we still need to send someone out because they're under duress or just a code that everything's okay. Um, but it's worth having an alarm system for that reason, particularly if you stay at home by yourself for any periods of time. You're, you have uh, spouses that do a lot of traveling, those kind of things. So um, we talked about that one earlier. Some of this stuff gets a little repetitive, but it doesn't hurt to hear it more than once. Um, newspapers, I talked about this. And newspapers and mail, be real careful about that. Have someone pick that up. Um, we talked about the ringers. Don't leave valuables lying around in areas where they are visible through doors or curtains. I'm going to say that again. Uh, closed and locked. Some of this is a little bit repetitive. Shrubs beneath your windows. Again, this is another window thing. You don't want them covering your windows, but if they're beneath the windows, particularly that uh, holly that's really, have you ever, do you, have you ever been around that holly? I can't think what they call it, just holly. They got some really sharp edges to them, and you try to prune that stuff. I mean, you come out all cut up. But if you have some of that low level around your windows, you've got to either step on it or get right in front of it or behind it. And it makes it really difficult. Again, not covering your window, but just high enough so that they got to deal with it to get in through the window, because it's going to hurt them a little bit. And they may very well, I mean, you don't want them to go to the neighbor's house, but they may go to the neighbor's <laughs> house if they, 
anything to keep them from coming to your house. A sign in the yard, you know, I hate it for the neighbors, but a sign in the yard that says you have an alarm system. If I'm a if I'm a bad guy, if I'm a burglar and I'm walking down the street and I got five houses that don't have signs and this house has a sign, why would I go to the house that has a sign in it in the yard? I mean, why risk going through all that mess with an alarm when there's other houses that don't have it? Again, it's a good idea for everybody. To have it. You don't want to, you know, you don't want your neighbors to get hit by them either, but it does protect you to have that. Um, pull down garage door. This is some more stuff on uh, the house. This is a different graphic. Never leave it. I think there was a few things on here I saw that weren't on the other picture I showed you. Solid wood doors, lights front and back. I do like having lights, particularly if you're gone. Motion detector lights. I don't know if any of you all have thought about those. I've had them before. They don't always work great. Sometimes the sensor wears out and they'll come on when They'll go off when somebody comes around and come on when they're not, and that's not the way you want it going. But um, if there's motion around your house, it's going to light them up. So if they're coming around the back of your house, you've got a motion sensor on your floodlight, it comes on. They're going to be lit up, so that's probably going to move them away too. So having lights on or having motion detectors where uh, it lights up if they come around your house is a good idea. Uh, sorry, this, this is a little bit, um, but they are looking for signs that you are not at home. So anything you can do to throw that off, which is music playing in the house, lights coming on at random times, um, people picking up your papers, anything that makes it look like somebody's there, you're better off. You don't want to give out signs that you're not at home. Now, let me see if this works. You can cut for just a second so we can get this. This is where we were having, this is a, uh, this will recap some of what we talked about. Save Try to get off the. Uh, That's right. Save a minimum of six hundred dollars okay. a year on your homeowner's insurance by simply. Yeah, that'll be done in a second. I can't. I can't move the cursor over. Unfortunately, that's what we were. At least six hundred dollars every year. So we got to listen to the commercial. I'm not going to maximize it because we have to try to get back to it. So it'll start in just a second. There's a lot of good YouTube things. I did some research, and so go back after today. Just YouTube some of these subject matters. There's some really good things on it, and I like this one in particular. Just, it's, you have to listen. It's a little hard with the.
sure that we're not leaving things like ladders or different types of things that can be used for the burglar to get up to the second story of our home where we feel like no one's going to come in this window it's on a second story or it's behind the house. Burglars love to use ladders that we can use there for them. Make sure that you're locking your ladders in your garage or somewhere else safe where burglars can't get in. The last thing that we're going to talk about is notifying your neighbors, getting to know your neighbors, and letting them know, hey, I'm going to be on vacation for a couple days. Can you just keep an eye on my house? If you see anything funny, call 911. Putting these few simple things into practice can highly increase the chance that your home stays safe and protected against burglars. Protecting your home and your family should be some of your highest priorities. So let's do simple things like this to keep our families and ourselves and our homes safe. I'm Gabriel Williams, and we've been talking about 10... Get this back up. Let's see here. Hold on a second, here we go. That's good up there. All right, okay. It's a little trickier than it ought to be, but um, he reinforced a lot of what we talked about. One of the things I didn't mention, I liked what he said, some people leave ladders against the back of their house, and that, that's real easy, you just, and you don't think about it. It's there when I need it because it's a hard thing to store, but store it in your garage. If you have a ladder sitting against the back of your house, it's easy for a burglar just to use that, and that's what they'll do. Um, okay, let's try to. So, um, senior home living safety tips. Some of this will get a little repetitive based on what we just did with some of the other things. Um, know how much is too much to lift. Everybody thinks they can do more than they probably can do. Even when you're younger, that tends to come into play sometimes. We lift things that are too heavy. Uh, that can risk an in, that could, in particularly if you're alone, you can be injured. You might find yourself where uh, you're needing help and you can't get to the phone to get help. Uh, ask for help when lifting moving heavy objects. You've got people you can call to do that. Uh, when you're taking medicines and things of that nature, have the lights on so you know some of the pills and things you take have the same kinds of shapes. Be very careful because if you take the wrong thing, you don't always realize that something's wrong with you and happens, you have no idea it was from the medication you took. So having a lit area where you take these medications is important. Uh, to help lower your risk of heart disease, doing any kind of, or any, any sort of disease, I think, maintaining a healthy lifestyle, if you can do exercises or walking, Debbie's, you know, Debbie can set you up with that. It's good for people of all ages to be involved in some sort of physical fitness because it has been shown to prevent lots of later life type uh, ailments and diseases. So always uh, do that even, you know, there's things that you can do at any age. To help prevent falls, you know, one of the things you gotta be careful of, and this is for anybody, uh, you have a lot of area rugs now, a lot of people have hardwood floors, they have area rugs. There are things, those rugs can slide on the floor. Sometimes you think they're pretty sturdy, but you could easily kick up an edge and trip over it. Uh, there are things you can do to get that, there, there's, there's there's material you can buy that you can put on the floor that the rug rests on and it keeps it from sliding or from, uh, it can still turn up if you kicked it right, but it sure helps that. So there are things you can do to keep uh, area rugs from bunching up where you might fall or where they might slide out from under you. Um, don't get too confident in the rug on the floor that it's gonna stay there because they do tend to move. We just talked about exercise, didn't we? Um, if you're someone, this is an interesting thing about insulin. There's a lot of folks nowadays that have diabetic issues. I think type two is what people tend to get as they sometimes later in life. So, um, but if you or anyone you have uh, insulin has a insulin can it does not react well to different sorts of elements. Uh, cold, hot, direct sunlight, glove compartment is going to go bad. So you don't want to depend on insulin that has been uh, not refrigerated or it's been kept too cold or it's been in the light. So be real careful about that if you're taking care of somebody or if you're on it yourself. Uh, put a security whistle on your key. Um, 
if you're out walking around, this is a good idea, uh, and I've heard this in other situations too, that if you've got some sort of a whistle device, and again, this is anybody of any age, if you go out and do a lot of walking, run trails, do those sorts of things, have some way to make a lot of noise. Um, and so a whistle's a good way to do that, particularly if you're in an area where other people are around, they're gonna look to see where that whistle's coming from. So if you ever feel threatened, use that. Um, now this says curtains parted when you are on vacation so your house doesn't have an empty look. I, I go along with that a little bit. We talk about keeping everything shut up, but I don't mind having a little bit of, of opening in some of the curtains or some of the windows so that it does look like it's not totally shut up. Um, you, want, you don't want it so open that you can look in and see a lot of what you have, but having a little bit of openness in the house is okay. Uh, make sure you keep all your uh, medications written down and on a plan so that you know how to use those. Now this is some walking around, so that was very brief on, on the senior tips, but a lot of it's repetitive. Uh, just walking around, daily life type things, we all find ourselves in these situations. You're at the gallery late at night and you come out of a store, the parking lot. One thing I've never figured out about the gallery is the parking lots are always sort of dark. There's a few that aren't, but I've never, well, I've ne I never understood why there's not more light out there because they do have incidences that happen. Um, but if you don't ever walk out to a car by yourself late at night in a dark lot, go in and try to get someone to escort you out there. If you feel a little funny about it, just don't do it because that's when things happen, particularly if you're a female. And that could be a grocery store, a shopping center. It could be leaving your place of work. It could be, you know, there's lots of different scenarios you can think of where it's dark, it's late, there's nobody around here. <coughs> I gotta walk all the way to my car. Um, try to get somebody in the store that you just came from or um, just somebody that you feel you could trust that's in whatever establishment you were in that could walk you to your car. I think everybody's found themselves in those situations where they feel a little uncomfortable, have you? Where I, I'm a little nervous about walking to my car. Don't do that, just get some help. <clears throat> if you're with people, that's helpful too. You know, even with friends, when you're going out and about at night, be with friends. Avoid d dark, deserted areas. Stay in well-lit areas, particularly parking a car. Choose the areas that have the big lights in the parking lot, not the dark parts of the parking lot. That's always good. Sometimes parking your small car in between two huge SUVs, that screens you out. You know what I'm talking about. You can't see around them, it's, and it's dark, and so anybody could be hiding around one of those SUVs, and you go get into your car, they could come attack you, and nobody could see it because the cars are in the way. So think about that sort of thing, too. Um, when you're doing your runs out in trails and different things around town, there's lots of those places where people walk and run nowadays, uh, don't feel the need to dart off and create your own path somewhere. Stay on the main path and the main trails. If something seems odd, try to get a description of an individual that you see that might look a little bit strange and let law enforcement know because they do have weird people hang out in some of these areas where people, I'm thinking of across uh, Sanford, <laughs> Sanford and, and the Mountain Brook Trail, you know, that goes that nice trail. I run it, there's a lot of people that go out there and use it, but there have been some strange people in the past that have done some odd things. And um, so you always have to be aware of any of those public places. <clears throat> if you're out and about and you, you know, girls, you're carrying a purse, um, be real cognizant of where that purse is. Uh, you know, wear it around the front. I, I, don't, I don't wear a purse, I don't know all the ways you do it, but <laughs> around the back, um, you know, anything where somebody can s get to it with you not seeing it you, want it, you want to hold it in front of you. If you're sitting in any kind of restaurant, any kind of public space, um, slinging it over the back of a chair can be real problematic, particularly in Europe. We'll get to that in a few minutes, but internationally, they are very good at getting your stuff. In this country, they're pretty good too if that's what they want to do. But if, you have your, if you're in a restaurant and you have your purse slung over the back of your chair, it'd be so easy to distract you and get your purse. Um, the waiter comes over and it starts asking you something. Someone else swings by and just walks off with your purse. You never know what happened. They're good. I mean, it's not novices that do this kind of stuff. They're people that know, how to, know when you're distracted and know how to get your purse without you knowing about it. So keep it in front of you. Don't set it in the chair next to you at a booth in a restaurant or at a chair at a restaurant. Uh, keep it in front of your feet or keep it in your lap. So just deal with, you, that's just something you have to deal with. If a driver stops to ask directions, avoid getting too close to the car. You know, you gotta be real careful if you're walking and somebody pulls up and says, could you tell me where so-and-so is? You know, a lot of times that's innocent and they don't know where a certain street is, but back up a little bit where they can't reach from their window and tell them I think it's this street over there. You can tell pretty quick whether you think they're legitimate or not, but don't get so close 
where you're listening in to hear what they want to say because they might just reach their arm out and try to grab you. So be real careful about that nowadays, uh, anybody asking for directions. If you're being followed by somebody, here, here's another thing, particularly when you're out at night or shopping centers or so many people nowadays are living on these phones. You know, you're walking out of a store and you're checking your messages, see did anybody, you know, email me, did I get any missed calls? So you're walking through a parking lot like this. That is the worst thing you can do. You're totally unaware of anything going on around you. So as important as you are, as you think you are, it can wait till you get inside your locked car to check that message or to return a call. Not while you're driving the car, but in the parked car, right? <clears throat> um, but if you, if you have the urge to look at your phone, anybody around knows that you're not paying any attention, you're vulnerable. If you're walking through a parking lot or walking outside for leisure or whatever and you're looking around constantly, you're making eye contact with people that see you, making eye contact's real important, at least they see that you saw them, generally that's going to be enough to dissuade them against going after you because they see that while they're alert and aware, I'm not going to be able to sneak up on them. Those little simple things like that can make a big difference in whether somebody approaches you with something um, nefarious or not. So just be aware of your surroundings and don't stare at an devi electronic device when you're walking around town. If you're being followed by someone in a car, uh, turn and walk in the opposite direction. Uh, try to get their license number because they're going to have to do a U-turn. If, if you turn your walking steps, then they're going to have to figure out a way to turn around. If they do that, you know you're being followed. Duck into some kind of restaurant or gas station or whatever happens to be around you. If you're in a remote area, take off running through the woods or something. I mean, you want to get out of that situation. Um, when you return home, have your key ready to open the door to your house. I think probably a lot of you do that. Don't fumble through your purse or your pants pocket or whatever. When you get out of the car trying to figure out, okay, where's my house key? If that's what you use, you probably have a garage you go into. But uh, if it's something you have to do to unlock, particularly at night, have that ready to go. <clears throat> when you're gone home, when you leave your place at night, and turn a light on outside so that when you come home, your house isn't totally dark and you pulled out the wrong key, oops, that's not the right key, I gotta find the right key, wrong key, I gotta find the right key. You wanna make sure you've got light that you can see what you're doing. Um, some of this stuff's simple, but I don't know that everybody always does this. If you're on your cell phone, keep your head up, be alert. You know, talking's one thing. I can, I can look around at everybody if I'm walking through a parking lot and going to my car. This is okay because I'm looking at everybody around, but it's, it's looking at your phone down here, texting or emailing where you t lose total awareness. Just be aware of everybody that's around you and look at people that might be off in the distance and see that they saw you because that's going to deter them. If you're being followed, um, here's one of the things in a car, I don't know if anybody's ever felt like they've been followed or they think they are. Um, don't ever go home. Don't ever let them know where you live. If you feel nervous about somebody in a car that might be following you around, uh, drive wherever you got to drive to be as close to a door of a business or the police station. If you know where the local police or fire station is, go to that place. Um, don't, uh, don't, don't just stop and get scared and definitely don't go to your house, but go to a business and go inside and say, I think I'm being followed, call the police. Just don't park somewhere where you got a long way to go to get into the business. Go somewhere where you can pull out of the car and run in you know, make sure they're open. <laughs> Don't get out of the car and go to a closed business. So if it's late hours, try to find a police station. <clears throat> or call the police station and say, I'm coming to the Vestavia Hills Police Department. I'm driving on 31. Somebody's following me. And I'm, you know, so I'm coming to your station here in the next three or four minutes. Do whatever you got to do. If you're having car trouble, raise the hood, stay in. If you're in trouble, and you're in trouble, there's nothing you can do. If your car's not running and you're on the middle of the interstate, there's really nothing you can do unless you know how to fix it. So. You need to hopefully have a cell phone. You need to call law enforcement of some sort or call a friend or do something. Uh, raise, your, raise your hood and stay inside the car with the doors locked. Be real leery of anybody that stops to help you. Just call somebody as quick as you can. In fact, I'd call somebody before I raise the hood um, because you want to make sure that you have somebody on their way to help you before people start stopping. Keep your purse and other valuables out of sight under the seat. When you're driving around, it's something you may not think about. I really didn't think about this until I saw this tip. But uh, if you're driving around town, anything valuable you have, keep it under your car seat or keep it hidden where anybody looking in your car doesn't see, well, she's got a purse over there or I see this or that or look at all the shopping bags. You know, always put your shopping bags in the trunk, even, even if you know you're going straight home. That way they're not just sitting there. If you did have car trouble and somebody sees you've got a lot of stuff you just bought. Um, 
well-lit areas, we talked about that. Don't park in isolated or visually obstructed area near walls, heavy foliage. You know, parking lots have this kind of stuff, places you go. Parking on the side of the street sometimes, you can be in some remote areas where it'd be real easy for someone to hide behind the bushes. Always be aware of that stuff. Valet parking, valet keys will start the car, but they can't get in the trunk and those kind of things. So if you ever need to leave a key with somebody, use a valet key. Uh, be sure to only, you know, remotes now on keys, you hit it twice and it unlocks all the doors. You hit it once and it unlocks your door. Don't just always hit it twice when it's just you. You don't need all the doors in a car opening. Just hit it once. The, does everybody know what I'm talking about? The driver's side door unlocks, and that's all, the only door that needs to unlock, because if you unlock all the doors and somebody's expecting you're going to do that, and they're hiding off in the bushes next to you or behind the car that's parked next to you, they're going to make a, you know, once you get in the car, they're going to jump in the other side if they really have some, something in mind. So don't give them that opportunity. That's all that's saying. We talked about the valuables. Uh, be alert to people that are just sitting in their car. You know, I see that all the time now. I, I'm in a parking lot, and I'm going, why, they, why do people sit in their cars so much? I do not understand it. I'll, I'll pull up somewhere, and somebody's just sitting in their car. I don't really know what they're doing. They might be talking on the phone or waiting on somebody that's in the store. But there's so many places now where people are just sitting in their cars. So be leery of that kind of thing. Most of the time, it's totally innocent. They're waiting on somebody, or they're just um, checking their phone or doing something. But if someone's sitting in their car where you pull into a spot, say, well, there's a lot of spots down there. I think I'm going to go park down there. There's no need to put yourself at that kind of risk. Um, we talked about the escort. If somebody approaches you, sometimes here's an, I think this, this may come up in another point, but if somebody's walking towards you and you feel like they're up to something, yell at somebody beyond them, even if there's nobody beyond them, say, hey, Fred, or whoever, just call out somebody's name like you finally see them, you know, there's someone you're looking for. And they're going to realize, oops, they're, they got a friend behind them. I'm not going to mess with them. I mean, it, it's, it doesn't hurt anything, and they're just going to keep walking, hopefully. They're not going to stop you because they see you're waving at one of your friends beyond them. It's another little thing that'll work. Um, follow your instincts. It's always important. Your instincts mean something, so always follow them. Look around your car when you approach it. Make sure you don't see anybody underneath the car. You don't see anybody in your car. It's always good to look inside the windows of your vehicle to make sure somebody's not in there. You never know what kind of devices they have uh, access to, electronic device, whatever, that can unlock your car. They can get in it, and you don't even know it until you're in it. So always look inside. Take a little look inside your car before you get inside it. LTD, lock the doors. Um, always lock your doors back. Most of them have these electronic features now where they lock when you turn the ignition. Not all cars have that, but um, if, if you've got a device that will allow you to lock your doors as soon as you get into the car, do that. Uh, don't be a target by turning your back while loading packages into your car. Um, be real careful with that. You know, you still be aware of everybody that's looking at you. When you're opening up a trunk or whatever, put things in, just make sure you got a good 360 of what's going on around your car. Windows rolled up too, obviously, as much as you can. Sometimes you have to roll them down for different things, but leave them rolled up. Um, Always think, think defensively when you're driving around and even on the street, you want to have a way out for an accident, for instance. Have enough space between you and always know who's behind you and always be thinking about if something were to happen now, if this car were to come in, you know, just safety tips for driving. If, uh, if there was a wreck in front of me and all the cars came to a direct standstill, am I going to go to the left? Am I going to go to the right? Where is the shoulder? Where am I in relation to the shoulder? Can I get around without the guy behind me hit me? Think of all the defensive things that you could do if something bad happened on the road so you know which direction you would turn your wheels to get out of the danger. Um, that's just a good thing to always be practicing anyway. If you're bumped in traffic by others, be real suspicious of that. If it, was, if it doesn't make sense and somebody just comes up and bumps you, that is a tactic they're using now uh, on interstates, on remote roads. Don't stop and get out because you were hit. Take the risk that, you know, insurance might not cover it, but go to the police station or go to a business or something and report it right away. Don't, don't get out of the car if you get bumped. And it do, it's not a, a logical thing like at a traffic light or something where they thought you moved. I mean, if it, if it doesn't make sense, you just keep driving. If people, demand, if people come up to you and you don't have any other choice, but they're asking for your money uh, and they have a weapon, you give them whatever they want and try to get out of there. Don't try to fight that if they have a weapon. Hitchhikers shouldn't be picked up. Don't stop and help people nowadays. Back in a long time ago, hitchhiking was okay. People picked people up and gave them rides, but don't trust anybody now. As innocent as they might look, we all want to try to be good people. 
got to be real careful with that, unless it's somebody you know. I mean, somebody you know and they're on the side of the road and they're trying, you know, I, I don't know anybody that does that these days. But if they're hitchhiking, it could be bad news. There's a lot of people that stop in these busy intersections and they have a sign that talks about they're homeless, they need work, can you give them a ride, those kind of things. We all feel bad about that, but be real careful about those types of people. Don't argue and try to face somebody that's trying to rob you. Um, never agree to be kidnapped. Uh, do whatever you can. Kidnapping is, the chance of you surviving that's not real high. So at that point, it's fight or flight. You need, to, you need to figure out some way to get out of that situation. And that's where you start doing, you start kicking and screaming and hitting in all the appropriate places to try to get the guy, you know, get the guy away from you. You just take off running. Don't allow yourself to be kidnapped. Um, if you are forced to drive, consider crashing your car. That's, that's a tactic you might not think about, but have a wreck. You might get hurt a little bit, but it might beat the alternative. Um, hit the horn of the car. Um, you probably can't use your phone because they're sitting in the car with you. Now here's a little quiz I put together. Very basic, just a f three questions, but it just lets you see a few scenarios and how you would, and it covers a little bit of what we've talked about. It's some common sense things, but it's one of these things where there might be a couple answers that look like they'd be pretty good, but it does give you the best possibility. And I'm going to let you read the question, and then I'll give you a few choices, and you just write down what you think the choice is. We're not taking these up, but then it'll show us what the correct answer is. So let's say you're walking to your car in a deserted parking area after working late, and uh, you hear someone behind you who is quickly approaching. Um, so you're, you're, it's dark, you hear s steps behind you, you're not sure what it is, but it's coming from behind you. You realize that person can reach you before you can get to your car. You have a sense that my car's way down there, they sound like they're close enough. What would you do in that situation? Here's your choices. Don't look back, walk faster, try to get into your car before they reach you. That's one choice. Put your hand on whatever defensive tool you're carrying, turn your head so you can see who's approaching. Now, we didn't talk about defensive. You know what one of the best defensive tools you have when you are a female walking around or a male, it doesn't matter. I don't have many keys on mine, but put your keys, if you got a big key ring, which a lot of y'all have bigger key rings, you put them between your, see that? That's a heck of a weapon right there. That's a great weapon. And anybody, I mean, you're gonna slash them. If you're holding it tight like this, walking through a parking lot, and you're looking around, you're gonna hurt somebody. They're not, you know, so that's a great weapon right there. Um, put your hand on whatever defensive tool you're carrying, turn around, stop and turn around, pull out a weapon if you're carrying one. Those are your three choices. <laughs> so just jot down what you think the right answer would be. And I could see how you would think about all those in this kind of situation. Does everybody in their mind have an idea of what, how they would answer it personally? I'm not going to call on you. All right, let's see what the answers are. Um, oh, right, we're going to do, I'm sorry, we're going to go through the questions and then we'll come back to the answers. Number two, you are on a long drive and stop at a fast food restaurant late at night. When you return to your car in the deserted parking lot, you encounter a man with a knife in his hand who orders you to go with him. What would you do in this situation? Scream. Uh, cooperate with him and look for an opportunity to escape. Try to talk him out of it. Refuse to go with them and resist in the strongest way possible. Pretend to faint. <laughs> think about that for a second. Jot down what you think the answer is. Have it in your mind because we'll come back to it. And question number three. I didn't write three by this. Okay, you are preparing dinner for your children when your ex-husband, currently under restraining order, this is a domestic thing, begins banging on the door and screaming that he is going to kill you, what would you do? And you've got a child at home. Get the kids into a safe room, arm yourself, call the police. Collect your kids and leave by another door. Try to talk them out of it while your oldest child calls the police, or call the police. Um, think of what you do in that situation. Gets you thinking a little bit, doesn't it? Because these scenarios have happened and will happen. Hopefully not to you. Question one was, you're preparing dinner for your children when you, or your ex-husband currently under restraint weight. No, that's the wrong one. Sorry about that. Let's go back to the, that. That got put in the wrong space. Okay, this was where you were walking through the parking lot late at night. Ignore that up there. Somebody, you hear somebody approaching you from behind. You hear steps. But you think they're going to get to you before you get to your car. Um, 
the options were what you wrote down as an answer. We talked about one of his walking faster in the situation is not a good idea. The problem, or the, the answer was don't look back, walk faster, try to get to your car before they reach you. That was one of the options. They're saying just walking faster is not the best thing. The problem statement, um, you can reach your car before they get to you. <coughs> Ignore the fact that uh, that has put yourself in unnecessary danger. By not looking back, you can't identify the person following you and you can't assess the situation. It could be someone totally innocent. It doesn't mean they're bad just because you hear steps coming up behind you. So don't get too defensive at the start. Um, the right question is put your hand on whatever defensive. If you've got keys, you got your keys. You don't know who's behind you. Um, turn your head so you can see who it is. They may be totally innocent, nothing to worry about. Uh, but this is the best of the proposed situation. Since you can't reach your car before they catch up to you, there's no point in running to the car because they might just start chasing you then, though you might want to continue moving towards it. By glancing back, you get a good look at the person. Uh, you'll be able to describe them. They see that you see them. Uh, they might see that you've got that little weapon in your hand. They don't know that it's keys. They're not sure what it is. But by having some defensive tool, even chemical, you know, the mace spray, those kinds of things, and keeping it out of sight, you are prepared to take defensive action without actually having to do it. So that's the best answer. Question one was, um, uh, the other one was stop and turn around, pull out a weapon. You don't want to do that because you don't know that the person's defense, you don't know that they're after you. You don't pull out a weapon. That creates all kinds of havoc, particularly a gun. You never want to use, pull out a weapon that you're not prepared to use because they'll use it on you. Um, unless you're really confident that you're going to use whatever that weapon is, don't pull it out because you're going to be the one affected by it. Uh, this is an overreaction. You don't know who that person is. You don't have to have a weapon ready to go at that time. So, um, question two was you're on a big long drive stop at a fast food restaurant late at night. When you return to your car in the deserted parking lot, you encounter a man with a knife in his hand who orders you to go with him. What would you do? All right, you can read that little scenario. Screaming, um, that's definitely going to get some attention. Uh, again, it depends on if there's not many people around, it's not the best thing to do. And it said this is a deserted parking lot, so nobody's going to hear it but the person that's got a knife. Uh, that's just going to agitate them. Um, so that tells you a little bit about what screaming will do. Screaming is a good first step, but you need to be follow up with some of these other things. Cooperate with him and look for an opportunity to escape. Uh, that's not really the best thing either. Um, if you cooperate with him, you're going to get taken. Uh, I tend to say you don't want to be too defensive because you don't want to agitate them, but you don't want to do what they want you to do because that's just going to let them achieve their objective. Um, he's planning to take you someplace that's easier to escape from where you are right now. Don't leave the area with him. Get into your car with him. Fight back. That's your choice. Uh, try to talk him out of it. Talking is not likely to be effective against a knife, though talking like screaming is often a good thing to distract him while you're figuring out what to do next. If you can talk to him and keep him right there, you increase both the chance of someone noticing your predicament and your opportunity to plan a counterattack. It allows you to think a little bit while you're talking. Um, the right question is refuse to go with him and resist in the strongest possible way. So this would be at the end of the day after all those little scenarios, this is what you want to do is resist because if he gets you and he gets you in that car, your chances go down dramatically. And this explains a little bit about why that's important. I'm not going to read all that. But you do whatever you can to resist. Running is sometimes the best option. If they have a weapon, you run in a serpentine fashion so they can't get a direct shot on you. You do whatever you can do to get out of there. <clears throat> um, you don't want to pretend to faint. Okay, question three. This is where you're in the house. Your ex-husband comes in. You've got a little kid. They're threatening to kill you. They're trying to come in the house. The correct answer on this is actually this one. Get the kids to a safe room, arm yourself, and call the police. Um, speaking of this, this gets off the subject just a little bit, but in any kind of scenario at home, you should have a plan of action for if you guys are at home in the middle of the night and somebody breaks in your house, what, are, what is your family going to do? If you have kids, what are you all going to do? If you hear that noise or we come and scream some sort of code word that you know what you have to do, you should have some plan, whatever it is, whether it's a hall, whether it's a closet, whether it's some reinforced area of the house that doesn't require them to go out into the common part of the house where the criminal might be, but it might be up in a bedroom. It could be in a bathroom where two, or two doors can be locked. It could be in a bathtub. There's just scenarios you need to think through what is the best plan of action for your family if somebody breaks into your house. So be thinking through that and, and devise a plan of action for your family on how you would deal with it and who is going to deal with what's going on with the criminal, who's going to make the phone call, 
if the person is armed, who's going to go confront the, cr uh, the criminal, whoever, whatever it is, come up with a plan on how you guys would react if something happens. Because I think more than not, people don't have a plan, things happen. They don't know what to do. I got two kids down this hall, one down this hall, what am I going to do? How am I going to find them? Did they jump under the bed? Or they, you know, how, what's, you got all this stuff going through your head. So if you have some plan that you can enact and even practice it as a family, um, at least you know exactly where they are based on the plan. And that could help, you know, thwart some other bad things. So always have a plan. <clears throat> See, okay. Okay, collect your kids and leave by another door. Um, now, this could work if you know that there's a door real close to the two bedrooms and there, you know they came in through that part of the house and you know a way to get out through the back of the house. That might work. Just know your house, know your layout. Probably not the best idea, though, to try to do that if somebody's in your house. Um, try to talk while your oldest child calls the police. Don't make your kid call the police. Uh, this is not probably the best method. But that gives you some things, scenarios to think through. We could think of a lot of different scenarios of what would I do in this situation. But all this is trying to do is prompt you to think of the kinds of things that could happen to you personally based on your situation and how you would deal with it if it happens. Again, coming up with a family safety plan, trying to figure out what the best course of action is if somebody were to break in your house would be an important thing to do. Think of the different scenarios that could happen. Think of how somebody likely would break in if it were the middle of the night, where the other people in the house are, where they should go to, come up with a room. Same thing for storms, other things. You know, have a place where you go if there's a storm coming through. Think through that stuff. Talk it over with as a family so you have a plan and have some sort of code or Two in the morning, somebody blurts out some loud word that's a code. Your kids know what that means, and that means we better get under the bed or whatever it happens to be. So, and you know, you know where they are. You know where they're hiding because you came up with the plan when it's all said and done. Um, anytime you can call the police, that's the best thing. Have a phone. I don't know how many of you charge your phone in your own room at night, but have a phone that you can always get to. Know how to hit 911 have it speed dialed, whatever. Always be able to do that immediately because even if they come out and it's a false alarm, but some, a tree crashed through your house and you thought someone was breaking in, that's still better. At least you were, you know, at least, at least they came out and they were ready. So always have a phone nearby. That's your quickest, best thing to do is call the police when you hear something like that. All right, now we're gonna jump on to some international stuff, airline safety, and we will be out here on time, I promise. But. Um, this is getting into some international thing, airline travel. Again, I told you there's a ton of information we can talk about, and we're going to scratch the surface of a lot of things. So we're jumping subjects now. Um, how many of you all fly on some semi-regular basis? It is not fun. It is a pain. Uh, I have to do it, and I don't like it at all anymore because you have to go through so much security, but it's all there for a reason. Um, but there's some things we can do to keep ourselves safer when we are traveling. Um, in crowded terminals or flights, Again, you want, you want people, you, you, you want to make sure your luggage is being looked at. Anytime you fly now, you're going to hear these PA announcements constantly in the airport. To, if you see any unattended bags, report it, because that's the way a terrorist, you know, if they want to bring a bomb into the airport and they didn't have to go through security yet, they may just have a bag they walk in with and they set it down somewhere prior to going through security. It'd be hard to do it past security, but they still make the announcement there too. Um, be attentive to unmarked bags. Feel free. There's plenty of TSA people walking around airports. Report that to them if you see it. Um, when putting your carry-on baggage to the x-ray belt, uh, the, 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 a little trick I have on, on these x-ray belts, I, when I get into the airport, the first thing I do is I, I take all my, my phone out, my change out, my keys out, my belt off, anything metal, my watch off and I put it in my briefcase or I put it in my carry-on bag. I have anything metal out of me before I ever get near security. So I'm done with that because it just goes through the belt because I'm going to have to, or through the security belt, I'm going to have to do it anyway. So take it all off before you ever get near there. Just start taking everything off that you're supposed to take off. And you don't have to deal with it. Then all you got to do is um, take your shoes off and, well, I've got one of those things where I don't even have to do that anymore. But, um, you have to go through some of that other stuff. Your laptop, if it's a folding laptop, you have to take that out. If it's an iPad, you don't have to take that out separate. That can go through in your briefcase. That, it's just the open laptop that they have to inspect separately. Um, overhead bins are another thing. I, I only do carry-on now, but that's gotten to be a lot worse because everybody does carry-on because you have to pay to check a bag now and the bags don't always make it and they get lost, so everybody's doing carry-on. So there's not enough overhead bin space for everybody flying with carry-on. And so now you have to pay extra to get a boarding zone 
that will allow you to have space that somewhere on the plane that you can put your carry-on. But if you can do your luggage in a carry-on and do it where you can see it, where you don't see other people trying to get you know, your luggage or walking off with your luggage, I like to have a visual of where my luggage is because I don't want to see somebody else walking off the plane with it. Because when everybody's crowded, when you get off a plane, you can't go up and catch people six people ahead of that line. You're, you're locked in. So um, always have an eye on your bag if you can do that. Comfort, dressing for comfort is the best thing. Um, I always say to wear shoes because if there were some kind of in-flight accident or there was a, um, you know, if, if you had a ground aggress where you had to get out of the plane really fast, you want some kind of covered shoe on when you're bailing out of the plane going down the slide or something. You don't want to have sandals or flip-flops. Think about that. Hopefully that's never going to happen, but if you did have to escape from a burning plane, plane on fire, emergency escape, whatever, you want to have some kind of shoe on. <clears throat> The safest seating is on the uh, exit aisle in the back of the airplane, usually farthest from the impact and farthest from explosive fuel. Now, the back of the airplane is not where a lot of people want to gravitate to because it gets noisy back there, but that really is the safest part of the plane. Um, I sit on aisle seats because my legs are long and the seats are horrible now. They're crunched. Aisle seats really, on an international flight, that's not what they recommend, and I'll tell you why, because if, uh, if, if the plane were to get apprehended in the air, hijacked, whatever, they're walking up and down the aisles of the plane and it's the person in the aisle that's going to get beat up on the side of the head or they're going to be used as the example. And so being the aisle person is not always the best seat. If you don't, if you don't have the plan to try to uh, take defensive action yourself if something were to happen, sit on the inside because then you're out of the way of where things might happen. I tend to like to know I can get out of my seat and deal with whatever might be happening. <laughs> I, don't, I, like to, I like to sleep on a plane with one eye open because nobody's going to get up to that cockpit. If someone's up there trying, I'm going to be up there tackling like everybody else. I'm just aware of that nowadays. So I want to be able to get out of my seat to deal with whatever's going on. Uh, if I'm not prepared to do that, sitting on the inside's the best thing because you want to be safe. Um, the time for greatest concern on any aircraft is takeoff and landing. Flying a plane is really simple. The, 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 Flying a plane up in the air, it's that stuff that happens when you're trying to land it that gets you every time. So um, that's when it's the most dangerous time on a plane. Um, and that's why they like you to have your seat belt and all that fun stuff on. And um, that's when the most critical things can happen. So pay attention to what they're telling you about flotation devices and all that. I know it gets really, really routine and mundane, but it does, they do it for a purpose. So um, just know what you would do if something were to happen. They have those oxygen masks that pull down. Know how to use those, because that does happen. Few, planes can uh, lose their uh, uh, pressurization, and you have no choice but to get on oxygen when that happens. And that can just be a mechanical issue until they're able to get to a lower altitude where it's not an issue. So pay a little attention to know how to use that if you have to. Uh, a, a pin flashlight's a really good thing to carry on a plane. Um, if it gets dark, there's an emergency, the lights go off, it's at night. You want to be able to see, to get your luggage, to be able to walk down the aisle, whatever. If something happened where it just got really dark on the plane, having a little pin flashlight's a good thing so that you can at least see. And the more of those, the better. It might help everybody out to have a little bit of light going on. <clears throat> Understand, again, the flotation device, if you're flying over water, those things. You're not going to live very long if you go down in water. I mean, you might not live when you hit the water because hitting water and hitting cement's not a whole lot different when you're coming down fast. Um, but depending on which body of water you land in, hypothermia sets in pretty quick. So depending on how quick they can get to you, you're on a limited amount of time anyway. But having the life, uh, having the flotation device could help those last 30 minutes be a little more comfortable. So. <laughs> so um, everybody know what this is? It's a wall. See, it's a wall. No, it's a, yeah. That is a passport. Um, these things, you're going to have to start carrying them more and more, probably, the way things are going. But uh, even on, and I never have thought about this, but even on a domestic flight, have your passport. What if you got hijacked and you end up in Canada or Mexico or something like that? It makes life a lot easier when they're coming on the plane trying to figure out who the Americans are um, if you've got a real passport. So consider carrying that. Just protect this thing like you would uh, the most valuable thing that you have uh, because it is a ticket, particularly internationally. That is, that is your ticket home. So um, that does make sense. I wouldn't have thought about that, but even on domestic flights, it might make sense to carry it. Um, this won't apply to anybody in this room, but don't drink too much alcohol. Alcohol and flying don't go well together at all, particularly on an international flight. 
you want to drink a lot of water, you want to keep yourself hydrated, that's how you feel the best when you get to the next country. Uh, or even flying domestically, it's very dry up there, it, it, it dehydrates you, so drinking water is the best thing you can do anytime. And that means soft drinks too, those, aren't, those don't help you out, those don't hydrate you, just drink water. That's the best thing to help you feel the best when you get to wherever you're going, whatever country you're going to, you will feel better if you're hydrated. Uh, this little thing right here, this is a shot record. If you do international travel, you're going into some of these third world countries, uh, they have shots that they require. It's a good idea for you to get those so you don't get the diseases of their land like uh, yellow fever and those types of things. And I, I was fortunate enough to be able to go to uh, South Sudan with Debbie and uh, Sally was on that trip. We had a mission trip there and I had a bunch of shots from my military. I, I, I thought I was totally immune from everything, but I realized there's four or five things I had to get a re, you know, re immunized for and yellow fever I don't think I'd had for years or ever had. So I had to get that. And what Debbie told me I will never forget, she said, you want to make sure you have that card that shows you have yellow fever and it's good because when you get to some of these third world countries and they want to make sure you've been vaccinated against yellow fever and you can't prove it through one of these cards, then they're just more than happy to give you a shot right there at the airport. And that needle might have stuck five or six other people before it got to you. So that, uh, that caused me to realize that that little yellow card is very important, and I treated that like my passport. So um, keep that in mind. If you get to a country, sometimes they will not let you in if you can't prove you've been immunized. So the only other choice is for them to give you a shot there, and I'm not going to let somebody in a third world country give me a shot. I would have had to turn around and come home because I'm not about to do that. So. Um, Anyway, that's an important thing about that, and that's, that's what this is. I just <clears throat> We talked about the metal. You know, that's, that's a pain. You've got to have all that stuff off. You think everything you're wearing is metal, and go ahead and get it off. I cannot stand to be behind people in the security line to act like they've never, maybe they never have done it. But they're, they got too much liquid in a bottle, or they got too much shampoo in something, and they're having to go through all their stuff and clean, you know. They're not thinking ahead. Think ahead so you're not holding other people out up and so you can get through that security line. Have all your stuff off, so all you gotta do is run it through the belt. You don't have to sit there in the line taking all your stuff off. Do it before you get up to the line. Um, now, this is something we're gonna talk about regarding international travel and how to blend in with your environment. And as you can see in these pictures, uh, a lot of these people, I would say they're tourists because, um, <laughs> and I'm gonna forego that video because it's a little bit complex to show these things and go back to the thing. But there's a little video I showed that on, on identifying people that are touristy, but I can talk about it plenty. I, the fella right here, do you suspect he might be French? <laughs> Does, is he from France? Is he born and raised in Paris, you think? Um, he's probably a tourist, isn't he? I mean, I don't know too many parishioners that probably go around doing that. But um, anything you can do to keep yourself from looking like a tourist, the better and the safer you are because anybody that happens to be looking at that is probably thinking that guy might be a tourist. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, that's what you want to do when you travel internationally. I mentioned it earlier. You want to do everything you can to keep yourself from appearing to be uh, American or Western. It's difficult because we all have demeanor. We have a look about us. We wear certain kinds of clothes. But anything you can do to blend in with whatever populace you're in, the better because the people that are looking to do bad things are targeting Westerners. And if, if you're from America, I don't care what your socioeconomic level is, you're wealthy. And you probably are wealthier than a lot of them. Um, so you've got money, you've got, you're vulnerable, you've got stuff, you know a lot of people that uh, they could probably get ransom from if they kidnapped you. So those are all the things that the bad guys are thinking about when they identify Americans. So if I'm an American and I'm in another country, I'm going to try to think of everything I can do to look like the people of that country so I'm not a target. That's not what you do. Um, Here's some of the stereotypes, and these are, these are stereotypes that the rest of the world has about Americans. Um, and that's just the way it is. That's what they think about us, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not. Um, again, this screams tourist too, doesn't it, this picture? <laughs> now, if you're in a Hawaiian resort or something, that's probably fine, everybody, you know, but if you're walking around some other country like that, that's, um, American tourists are not always on their best behavior. There's a lot of problems sometimes with Americans going overseas and getting with their group of friends and creating ruckuses and night spots and those kinds of things, and it just helps develop that reputation about Americans. Um, you don't, you know, this probably, fanny packs are no good anyway. Um, definitely not where you can see them because it's so touristy. I mean, you got all your stuff. Who walks around with that kind of stuff? You don't wear that with your business suit. 
I mean, that, that, those people are not from here. That's what I would say if I'm sitting in Italy or somewhere. That guy, well, obviously, he's got the American flag on his. So that's not what you want to do. Um, the other thing you want to do before you visit any country, I don't care where it is, is educate yourself a little bit. Get on Google. Get online. There are some neat um, apps you can get that have all this stuff about kind of something called the CIA fact book, and it's all unclassified. But it's an app you can get. Uh, you can get it on Droid. You can get it on the iPhone. And it'll pull up any country in the world. It'll give you maps. It'll give you all the medical data. It'll give you terrorism type stuff, criminal type stuff. It'll give you a ton of information. It doesn't even cost that much. But any country you have interest in, you can scroll down, click on it, and it gives you a lot of demographic stuff about the country and what you might want to know before you go there. So always learn as much as you can about the country. It's good to learn some simple phrases about their language. Um, you can learn about um, the greetings like hello, goodbye, thank you, excuse me. Those are real simple things to try to learn in a different language. You don't have to learn a lot of things, but that will help break the ice a lot better than speaking loudly in English to them. Most, most foreigners are not hard of hearing, but we tend to speak very loudly to them because the, we're trying to get them to understand us. But uh, learn a few phrases in their language and that'll be real helpful. This is an example. There's something, uh, US, if you ever Google U.S. State Department, I'm not even going to tell you the web link. I don't know what it is, but there's a site on U.S., uh, I think it's USStateDepartment.gov, and it will give you travel warnings. You can plug in a country you're going to, and you'll see a whole list of travel warnings for different countries that uh, have had warnings over the past six months or even the past couple years. You can click on it, and it tells you why that warning is in existence. It could be some uprising. It could be, uh, it could be some um, terrorist action that took place. Uh, so that's a good source to look at. I don't, I don't get my, it's good for a purpose of knowing something happened there. It's not very good to me to learn about the details of what went on. So I use it with a grain of salt, but I do look at it because I know which countries the State Department has put on their watch list or their warning list. And they had some reason for doing it. All the details about it may not be very thorough. It may be old information, but at least you know something went on there. So if nothing else, go to Google and put U.S. State Department and it's going to come up with the links that you can pick before you go to a country to explore it. Um, there's something called, I think it's STEP, S-T-E-P, and it, it stands for, Debbie, you know what that means. What's say, uh, smart uh, travel, like yeah, acronym, yeah. But, uh, uh, it's great in registry before you travel internationally, and it will uh, log if, if, you're, if you do not reach your destination in time, it will, you'll have people to contact at home. So anybody traveling, I do encourage them to register. We all, we register all yeah. of our mission trips with STEM. Or if something happened, they know that, hey, we got these six people, Americans, that are over here in uh, this area of South Sudan, and there's a huge uprising going on. We need to get in touch with them. So they know where you are. Uh, the State Department would have ways of getting in touch with you, hopefully. They'd have to go through the consulates and embassies and all that. But they know that the, our country knows where you are and you're registering what you're doing so that if something did happen, international incident, and you're stuck in a country, someone has a way of finding you or knowing that you're there. You're not just lost. Um, this is an example of a worldwide caution. This is Europe. This is very general. This has probably been up since 9-11 in some form or fashion about terrorists, you know, that traverse the European continent and they're in all the countries and they're recruiting and all that, you know, it's very general and it is true, this stuff's going on, it doesn't give you anything real specific, but it's just a general worldwide caution about European travel and that really would apply anywhere now. Every now and then the threat levels go up and down depending on where you're traveling to. I'm not going to do that one. That was going to show you the link of, um, I don't know how to go back, uh, but again, Google, U.S. State Department, don't worry about all the HTTP stuff, it'll give you the link to the U.S. State Department and you can look at the country you're going to. It's pretty easy to navigate around that page. Uh, just click on, it'll say uh, countries of travel, uh, worldwide travel warnings, you'll figure it out, it's very user friendly. Um, if you're going to be carrying a laptop or a cell phone or all that kind of stuff, take off everything you can. You know, I left, I leave mine at home on some trips mainly because I can't control when I might it might pick up a wireless from another place and I might get an email that connects me with something I don't want to be connected. I don't want people in that country. I used to be in the Intel world and I get these emails sometimes that are this generic because of some of the LinkedIn, a few LinkedIn sites I'm on. 
I get these blogs and things about stuff going on, and it says the intelligence source, or it has stuff that has intel in it. I don't need other people from the country getting my phone and seeing that I've got these sources that are part of the intel community. So I'm nervous about that because even if I delete those off, it doesn't necessarily stop a message from hitting my phone. So uh, think of this also. If you've got a contacts on your phone and you've got um, someone gets hold of your phone and they start scrolling you through your contact and they see uh, names of people, president of this company, doctor so-and-so, they're going to say, wow, this person knows a lot of folks with money. Let's hold them for ransom. We'll call these people and say, hey, I've got so-and-so. You need to send us money. So contacts in your mobile devices, in your laptops, in your computers connect you to people where they figure out, well, this person knows a lot of folks, knows a lot of people that probably have money. We can hold them for ransom. We got all their contact information. We can call them from here and tell them, I'm, I've kidnapped so-and-so. If, if you want them back, you got to send us so think about that. I mean, I'm not saying leave all that stuff at home because we all like to communicate when we're gone, but be aware of what could happen if it falls into the wrong hands. And um, does everybody, that make sense to everybody? We're going to have to move on. Uh, personal pictures, anything that ties you to anything. It's just a lot of work to do. It's just easier to leave it at home and buy one of those cheap phones when you get to the country and that you can probably get on wireless or make calls back home. You can buy these things in other countries, or you can buy one before you leave here at CVS, as long as it has a worldwide application, and then, or Walmart or wherever. I'm not trying to endorse any store, but uh, you can buy them anywhere. I mean, they're only 20, 30 bucks, maybe 50 bucks, and you get 300 minutes. I don't know. I've, I've looked into them before. It's been a long time. But take that with you. It has nothing in it but a phone number. You can use that to communicate with people. That's better than using your own phone, okay? Hotels in a lot of these countries will have uh, computers and lobbies. You can check your internet, email, and all that stuff with. Um, you have ways of communicating. In, in an international travel situation, nobody's more impressed with uh, us than we are with ourselves. So think of that. If something seems wrong, it probably is. Be, uh, this is some of the stuff we've already talked about. Be aware of what's around you anywhere you go in this world, in the city, in the state, in the world. Don't draw attention to yourself. Stay low key. Americans are loud. We laugh. We make a lot of eye contact. Overseas, they don't make eye contact. They don't laugh. They're not loud. So don't do any of those things. What I've done with groups that I've talked to before, before they travel internationally, I say, go sit on a park bench in uh, you know, Madrid, Spain, and watch people and pick out the Americans. And they'll go, what do I look for? You tell me. Pick them out. It's simple. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you to look for, but you'll know them when you see them. They're wearing white sneakers, white you know, socks with their, they're wearing uh, big cameras around their neck. They're looking at everybody. They got their Atlanta Braves ball cap on. <laughs> They've got, you know, uh, uh, I love Minnesota sweatshirt on. I mean, they're wearing all the stuff that just screams, I'm an American, I'm a tourist, I've got money. And um, don't do that stuff. When you see what they're doing, don't do that, okay? And that's one way that you won't be recognized as an American. Um, they wear, they don't wear shorts in a lot of these countries. Now, I break that rule every now and then, but nobody in Europe wears shorts. I've been over to the Middle East. They don't wear shorts. They wear long pants all the time. They wear long shirts all the time. It's crazy because I don't want to wear that stuff, but if you want to blend in, you've got to wear that stuff. Um, so just look at what the Europeans wear and go to the store and buy some of their crazy clothes to wear while you're over there. That's the best thing you can do. Don't be Mr. and Mrs. Happy walking around greeting everybody because they don't do that. When you're on public transportation, don't sit there and, you know, do all this stuff and look at people because they're not looking at you. It, that's weird. Don't look at people. I mean, I know that's the way we are. We like to be nice and greet and all that, but don't do that kind of stuff in other countries. It's a very tough thing to break away from, but you've got to keep that in mind when you travel for your own safety and for the safety of people around you. I don't like huge groups. I don't like these large groups of 15 people walking everywhere together. Some of these trips that we do with churches and other things, you can't avoid that, but that draws tons of attention when there's a big group of people. You can't keep high school kids or college kids, you can't keep them from not talking and laughing and doing what they're always going to do back home. But it's just something you need to be aware of. Have one individual in any group of people walking around looking at the group, being the aware person. They're paying attention to what's going on. You can rotate that uh, responsibility, but have somebody that's really focused on what's going on. Uh, don't ever go to ATMs by yourself. Have someone always go with you. Go inside a building. Don't do an ATM outside a building. Go inside a bank to use an ATM. Um, and I probably have spoken stuff I've already written up. Public, if I'm a terrorist, you got to think like the terrorist, okay? If I'm a terrorist, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to create a big media event, and I want to kill as many people as I can. When do you think I'm going to do that, and where am I going to do it? 
I'm probably going to think about public transportation during a busy time of the day when there's a lot of people on it. If there's any way you can avoid public transportation in other countries, whether it's buses, whether it's uh, subways, trains, those sorts of things, do it during non-peak hours because they're going to do it during a rush hour time because they want to kill as many people and affect as many people as they can, get the biggest media splash. So try to use public transportation during non-peak times. You can't always do it. You might be over there doing some sort of business. You can't just use it arbitrarily like that. But if you're over there as a tourist, plan your stuff on the uh, public transportation for times that are not uh, the peak times because you've just reduced your chance of being collateral terrorist a collateral terrorism event uh, in half or more because you didn't ride during a peak time. Again, you can't always do it, but if you can avoid it, that's great. Um, again, the typical American stuff that we all wear, just think about that when you're overseas. Flashy clothing. We wear a lot of bright stuff. Anywhere in Europe and overseas, you just don't see the bright, bright stuff like we were over here. Um, any kind of rings, jewelry, keep that stuff at home. If you got, you've got wedding rings, you know, diamond rings, those sorts of things. Don't carry that overseas. We all wear those kind of stuff in this country. They don't wear a lot of that in other countries. So just don't take it with you. Keep it in a safety uh, lock box or whatever. Don't carry it overseas. Um, be polite and low-key. Loud conversations, obnoxious behavior. We talked about it. Don't get in arguments with people. And plus, if you talk loud and people hearing you, they can tell you, well, they're speaking English. If you ever get into a really bad situation, though, where somebody has got you and they're saying, you're medicating, you know, all this sort of stuff and they're, you're starting to fear a little bit. I mean, if you know a little bit of, a, of another language, you start spitting out something and that'll, you know, or something. And they're going to, they're going to realize, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. Or if they really can't think you're American, say, I'm from Canada. What part of Canada are you from? I'm from, you better have a story about where you are in Canada. Canadians are not thought of near as negatively as Americans. So be Canadian. Canadians sound like us a lot of times, and you can get away with that. They look like us, they sound like us, so say you're Canadian. Don't let them see your passport. <clears throat> um, oh, public demonstrations, these things happen in a lot of places overseas. You're going to see big demonstrations. They flare up, particularly with economic things going on. Don't get so curious about those that you walk over, start taking pictures, and get in the middle of it. Look at it from afar. If they're way across the way, don't get anywhere near that because you're going to get caught up in something. And if they see, think that you're an American, you're going to get in trouble. So don't ever do that. Uh, if you ever look, if you ever get confused and lost, and you will when you travel overseas, you're going to get confused. You're going to get lost. Um, don't do it out in the public like these guys. Don't pull out a map and start staring at it in the city square because again, you're a tourist. You don't know where you are. Somebody's going to come offer you help, and it may not be who you want. Um, so go inside a restaurant some kind of establishment where you can ask somebody where you're out of public view when you're doing this. Uh, ATM scams, go with somebody. Notify your bank before you go overseas that you're going to be overseas because they may not allow your card to have transactions from Greece or from France because they didn't know you were going over there and you might, they might cancel your card. So let them know you're going to be gone for two weeks or a week. Um, this is, you know, taking pictures, conceal your camera when not in use. We use a lot of these kind of cameras now on phones. They're a whole lot easier to conceal. But if you have one of these big old touristy kind of cameras, don't wear it around your neck. Tourists do that. Um, always carry your, I'm one of these, there's going to be different rules based on the kind of group you go with as far as passports. I personally am going to have my, pa I'm not going to leave it in a hotel, I'm not going to leave it in a safe in a hotel. Uh, you may see things that say leave it in a safe in a hotel. I'm going to carry it with me. Or there's going to be a designated individual on whatever trip you're on that is holding those and keeping them safeguarded. But I'm personally going to have it on me worn around my neck, depending on the country, inside my shirt. So I'm going to know when somebody's messing with my neck. I mean, I'm going to be able to feel them getting at my passport. Um, so wear it. It may look goofy, but wear it where it's under your clothes, and it may not be real comfortable. Don't, have it in a pa don't put it in a backpack. Don't put it in a pocket, because if they're going to pickpocket you and they get your passport, you're in trouble. Um, Carry limited cash, credit card, keep one copy with you. I'm going to move through this kind of fast because I think I've touched on a lot of it. A dummy wallet's a good thing. Have one wallet that's got a little bit of money in it and the other's got the rest of your stuff in it. And if they absolutely you are in a bad situation, they got a knife in your back and they want your money, pull the wallet out and give it to them. It has a little bit of money in it, but it doesn't have all your other stuff. That's somewhere else. So it's a dummy wallet. Don't inv in volunteer information about where you're staying, what group you're with. I'm with a group of 80 people from Dawson. We're staying at this hotel. We're doing... Nobody needs to know your business. Uh, travel in small groups, avoid large groups. I talked about that. Um, I, I'm big on, you can't always do this, but if you're traveling and you're in another country, don't go stay at the Marriott or the Hyatt of, of um, Milan, Italy or whatever. 
go find a little small bed and breakfast. Again, if I'm a terrorist, I'm going to go after the Marriott, I'm going to go after the Hyatt, I'm going to go after the Hiltons, the Western sounding hotels that have Westerners staying there. Um, that's what I want to blow up. Uh, in Mumbai, India, five years ago, four years ago, they hit a Marriott, a huge terrorist bomb. It's a Marriott. Uh, that's where Westerners stay. So stay in some local hotel, a smaller hotel. Don't stay in these big ones because, again, they're going to try to make the biggest splash they can. Um, I'm going to go through these because I want to get pickpockets are really bad over there. Gypsies, uh, Rome is probably the worst part. They throw babies at you. You catch the baby, they go for your pockets. So be aware of those kind of things. Common targets are backpacks, pockets, purses, uh, void flashing. Email a copy of your itinerary to people when you're going somewhere. Be wary of shortcuts in foreign countries. Don't just walk places you don't know where they are. Always plan it out. This shows some pictures of uh, how easy it is. That lady's carrying bags and she's got a group of people that are watching her and they're doing a little diversionary tactic to get her bag. Um, here's another one. You've got um, somebody walking around. You know, that would be really easy to slip off. You've got this lady right here and this gypsy is right behind her in the back and she's about to do something. So um, this kind of stuff happens all the time in European cities. Uh, these are some things that you can take with you to be safe when you travel. Money belts that don't look, you know, goofy like the pack that guy was wearing with the flag on it. Organizers, this, thing, this is where you put your passport and your shot record, you wear it under your clothes. Security purses, they do make purses that have inside, they have these really fortified zippers. I don't know if anybody has those, but they, they'd be really difficult to get into. You might go to a travel store or something to try to find something like that if you do a lot of traveling. It'd be worth investing in instead of taking a normal purse over there. Um, I'm going to skip through these because we're going to talk a little bit about self-defense before our time runs out. Uh, we're not going to get into a lot of detail about this, but there are some things that you can do uh, personally um, to really, the biggest thing that is if an attacker comes up to you and they grab you, they don't expect you're going to react because they expect you're like most people won't have a clue what to do. But if you can think of a few things to do, these pictures demonstrate part of it. Anytime you shove your hand into the chin of somebody, they're not expecting that, particularly if you're a vulnerable female and you're walking around, they don't think you're going to do it. You, you cram it as hard as you can into their chin if you can get that front look at it. You take your fingers and jab them into their eyes, they're not going to do a thing after that. It sounds gross. But when it's life or death, you, you jam your fingers into their eyes. Um, if you hit on the side of their neck, these carotid artery, if you hit hard enough, it's like being hit with a stun gun. It almost feels like a bolt of uh, electricity. I've been hit that way before to test it out. But you're on the ground. It feels like a bolt of electricity. Don't ever be ashamed of hitting too hard or afraid to hit too hard. Use the hard part of your hand. It's probably like this bone or right here or the side of your arm and cram it and put all your body weight forward and cram it into the side of their neck and they're going to go down to the ground. It's like a shock almost. Um, I want to show you this. I think this is worth watching. These are three self-defense moves. <clears throat> I'm afraid we're going to have to watch a commercial. If I could skip that, I would, but I can't do it for some reason. My cursor doesn't work on this. That's a good feeling knowing that, that we're here. Uh, we're here for the long haul. The relationships that our portfolio managers have with our clients. Well, that commercial's going, uh, Doug makes a comment about making copies of your credit card when you travel. I also encourage you to make copies of your passport. Leave one with a yes. family member that you can contact at home, and it can be a fax over if, if yours are stolen or lost. And then also make a copy that you will carry somewhere other than your notebook when those people look. So always have at least three copies. Because that's a good note. scenario if you've ever traveled there and had those sorts of Sorry about this. Normally I can skip the ad. The cursor doesn't work on that, and I can't get it to work up there, so. In any dangerous situation, your first instinct is to escape. When you have to fight back, it's important to know what you're doing. Self-defense expert and author of Survive the Unthinkable, Tim Larkin, stopped by our offices with a step-by-step -step of three moves every person should know and hopefully will never have. Abandoned space. Let's say I'm about to be attacked. What's the first move I need to know? 
<laughs> so if, if you can uh, if you can think through those, keep remembering that little scenario because when things are happening, you can't. It needs to be instinctive. You need to you need to play these through your head. Like, what would I do right now if somebody attacked me? So that you're not thinking about those steps. We're not going to demonstrate that. All right. um, Ladies, we're going to be looking at some. This is actually good. It's playing the next one. I like this one too. This would be a common thing that could happen to you. If you want to learn more self-defense, go visit our website, nickjoseph.com. Stay safe. The, um, we're, we're really out of time, but there are, 
some of the main things I want you to think about, if someone puts you in a chokehold, you know, they were using the belt and that, but if they come around you with their, again, you want to yank down to try to keep it from strangling you, but if you turn around, it releases that. You're not normally thinking about turning around, and they're not thinking about you doing that either. But if they got you in a chokehold, turn yourself around and cram your uh, hand into their face. As hard as you can, you might break their neck, but that's okay, they're trying to kill you. So eyes, fingers in the eyes, they're not expecting that, and you can probably run after that because they're going to hit the ground, they're going to disengage from you, and you can probably get away. They have a gun, it's a whole different thing. If someone has a gun at you and they're pointing it at you, you've got the leverage by grabbing the end of the gun and twisting it. You can hit their hand in one, their arm in one direction and the gun in the other. You might break their wrist, but you've got the leverage on the gun and point it a different direction. If they, they're not going to be able to fire it with you twisting it. They're not going to expect you to do that. It takes a lot of guts to do it, but if a gun's coming at you, immediately grab it and twist it because you're going to hurt their wrist because you've got the leverage at the end of the gun. And it, there's, a, there's other techniques you can use, but hopefully you won't get into a situation with, with a gun. Now, you heard this guy say the reason that they got in that situation anywhere at the very beginning. Why were they in that situation? Awareness. Awareness. That should have never happened. They were busy playing with their phone. They would have seen this guy come out of the woods or wherever it was. They probably would have been aware something's about to happen and prevented that. So that's the key to self-defense is prevention and awareness. Keep yourself aware and you can alleviate a lot of this. This is some stuff you can carry personally for your own protection. Pepper spray, I don't know if anybody carries that. Um, it's very effective, it's not gonna kill them, but you can use it and they're not gonna do anything else after you spray them. Uh, again, carry that through a dark parking lot if you're comfortable with that. Um, mace is something else, uh, different kind of chemical, but pepper spray is what I'd recommend. These are taser guns. These have little uh, electric jolts that actually penetrate the skin, shoots an electric jolt into them. They're not going to do anything else to you after they get hit by that. You're not going to kill them. You're not going to go to jail for that. You know, if you're afraid of a gun, don't want to carry a gun because you're afraid to use it, don't carry a gun. If you're not 100% confident in using a gun, don't carry it. Go to a gun shooting class, some kind of a weapons class before you ever get a gun. But these are things you can use that won't kill the person, but it will keep them from attacking you. Uh, something else. Debbie's idea, and I've never heard of this before, but this is wasp, wasp and hornet spray. Um, this actually, have you ever used it before? It's, you know, I, don't know, I mean, it'll shoot from here to the end of the room. It's got a heck of a jet on it. So you carry that through a parking lot and hit somebody that's coming out. I mean, they may be totally innocent. You don't want to do it with somebody. <laughs> somebody looks a little funny 30 feet away, yeah. So um, make sure they get somewhat close to you, but I don't think they're going to keep coming after you with that stream hitting them in the face. That is a good idea. Again, are you going to walk around everywhere with a big can of hornet spray? So um, I don't know if that'll fit. Uh, this, they're not going to do a whole lot after this either. If it's a guy, they're, they're, they're not going to do a whole lot to you. If you get a good kick there, you can even kick this way or kick that way. But just keep these movements in mind Always be prepared to do it because you can't think about, let's see, what would be the best thing to do in this situation? It's got to be instinctive. It's got to be, I'm being choked, turn around and release the choke hold, cram my, my hand into their face, slap their neck back, uh, poke them in the eyes, hit them, hit them as hard as you can with your elbow right here in the sternum, kick them. I mean, these two or three things will happen so fast they're not expecting it and you'll probably get away. So just keep going through those in your head. Think about, you know, the different scenarios of how somebody could come up to you and how you would react. And I think that's one of the best things you can take away as far as self-defense that doesn't involve weapons. Uh, if they have a gun, grab the front of the gun before they know what's happening and start twisting it in their hand. and. Um, kick them, you know, in the right spots when that happens too. You might even be able to pull the gun away from them. Um, I don't want to go past what we said we were going to go. Uh, do you all have any questions at all? This was a lot of information. Again, it's the first time I've done this much in one presentation, so I wasn't real sure how it was going to go. Pacing could have been a little bit different, but um, any questions?